VOA1, <laughs> the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from Brian Lynn and Andrew Smith. Later, John Russell and I present this week's education report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Brian Lynn. Ukraine says it shot down 13 drones launched by Russia Wednesday over the capital, Kiev. A city official in Kiev, Serhiy Popko, wrote on the social media service Telegram the attempted strikes came in two waves. He said wreckage from the downed drones damaged an administration building and four housing structures. The snow-covered capital remained largely calm after the early morning attack, the Associated Press reported. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said in a video statement all 13 Iranian-made drones were identified by air defense systems and destroyed. The back of one wrecked drone had a handwritten message on it that said, For Raison. The message was believed to be a reference to an attack Russia claims Ukraine launched last week on a military base in the Raison area of western Russia. Drones have been used by Russia, along with rockets, missiles, and artillery weapons, to target power stations, water centers, and other infrastructure in Ukraine. The damage caused by Russian strikes has at times cut off electricity, heating, and water supplies to many Ukrainians as winter sets in. Ukrainian officials have praised the military's ability to identify incoming Russian weapons and shoot them down. But strikes in some areas continue to cause deaths and destruction, especially in areas close to the front lines in the east and south. In the southern city of Odessa, drone strikes temporarily shut off power last week. During an earlier round of Russian strikes on December 5th, Ukrainian officials said about 60 of 70 weapons were identified by air defense systems. This included 9 out of 10 that targeted the capital and the surrounding area. American officials said Tuesday the United States was set to approve sending the Patriot Missile Defense System to Ukraine. Ukrainian leaders have made urgent requests to receive defense systems and stronger weapons from the West to shoot down incoming Russian missiles. Zelensky pressed Western leaders as recently as Monday to provide more powerful weapons to help his country. The Patriot would be the most advanced surface-to-air missile system the West has provided to Ukraine since Russia invaded the country in February. U.S. officials told Reuters news agency an announcement on sending the Patriot system to Ukraine could come as soon as Thursday. Russia said on Wednesday the U.S. Patriot missile defense system could be targeted by Russian forces if it is deployed in Ukraine. 
Currently, no peace talks are taking place to end the war, which has killed thousands, displaced millions, and damaged major cities. I'm Brian Lynn. New Zealand passed a law on Tuesday to set a lifetime ban on buying cigarettes for any person born after January first, two thousand nine. This means that the minimum age for buying cigarettes will keep going up and up. And someone trying to buy cigarettes fifty years from now would need to show that they were at least sixty-three years old. Those who violate the law could face fines of up to ninety-five thousand dollars. But New Zealand health officials hope smoking will decrease. Well, before then, they have stated a goal of making the country smoke-free by 2025. The ban is part of the new anti-smoking laws that are among the strictest in the world. The law reduces the number of shops that can sell tobacco products from about six thousand to six hundred. It also decreases the amount of nicotine permitted in smoked tobacco products. Nicotine is an addictive element in tobacco. There is no good reason to allow a product to be sold that kills half the people that use it. Associate Minister of Health, Dr. Ayesha Verrill, told lawmakers in Parliament. She added, "Thousands of people will live longer, healthier lives, and." The health system will be five billion dollars better off from not needing to treat the illnesses caused by smoking. New Zealand has one of the lowest adult smoking rates among developed countries. The Organization of Economic Cooperation. And Development, or OECD, said the number of adult New Zealanders smoking fell by half over the past ten years to eight percent. And OECD data shows twenty-five percent of French adults smoked. In 2021, smoking rates remain higher among the indigenous Maori in New Zealand, with about 20 percent reporting they smoked. Verrill said the new laws would help close the life expectancy gap between Maori and non-Maori citizens. I'm Andrew Smith. In the 1970s, more than 800 students filled the classrooms of Chiante Elementary School in rural Hua Sun County. The school is set among a group of small villages and rice farms in southwestern South Korea. By 2021. The school's population had dropped to just twenty-four students. Without intervention, local officials said, 
Chiante Elementary could soon close. The large decrease is the result of both South Korea's falling birth rate and fast urbanization that has sent huge numbers of young people to the city for better jobs. The situation is the same for many schools across South Korea. Since 1982, more than 3,800 schools nationwide have shut down because of a lack of students. Most of the closures have happened in rural areas. In Dojang, a small village about a five-minute drive from Cheontae Elementary, locals understand that their community is on the edge of extinction. People in their 60s and 70s are considered young here, said 82-year-old Moon Gyeongga. There is not a single child in this village. Everyone with kids leaves for the city, Moon added. If the community loses its school, there would be almost no hope of bringing in young families. That is why Cheontae Elementary recently began taking part in a program that brings students from the capital city of Seoul to study in the countryside. Under the program, which started in March 2021, Seoul children study for at least six months in schools throughout the southwestern part of the country. The mostly rural area has been hit especially hard by South Korea's population crisis. The exchange program is paid for by both Seoul and local government groups. So far, Chante Elementary has seen hopeful results. Since it began accepting Seoul students last spring, attendance has doubled to over 50. Along with saving the school, the increased attendance has brought practical benefits for local students. Before the exchange program, it was difficult to find enough children to play team sports, like soccer or basketball, said sixth grader Lim Sung Ju. I have more hobbies now, and I can experience more things. Basically, I just have more fun, Lim said. More students also mean the school receives more resources and employees, such as a vice-principal who can work on lesson planning. Seoul Exchange students benefit, too. They are able to take a break from the overcrowded capital area. They can enjoy more outdoor activities, cleaner air, fewer crowds, and a less competitive educational environment. It's possible to educate the whole person here, said Kim Na Yoon, a Seoul local whose son is in the third grade at Chiante Elementary. The exchange students also report feeling less stress away from Seoul, said Hua Sun County School Chief Li Hyung Hui. This is good for all of Korea in the long term, she said. However, many locals worry the program is only a partial fix. They note it does not deal with the main problem facing rural communities, a lack of income for locals. The population is still not growing, said Pak Gong Ryol, a 67-year-old who has lived in Hwasun County for 18 years. Park supports the exchange program. He even helps run a housing center for exchange students and their parents. But he said the government should do more to increase the earnings of local farmers who have historically depended on small rice fields. Without that kind of intervention, hundreds of rural communities could soon disappear. A March study by the Korea Employment Information Service says 113 of South Korea's 228 cities 
counties, and districts are at risk of extinction. Cho Hee-yun leads the Seoul Metropolitan Office of Education. He is also the driving force behind the exchange program. He hopes this is just the beginning. He wants to one day attract enough students to expand the program to rural areas nationwide. We hope that by studying in rural areas, children will be able to escape the concrete jungle, experience living in nature, develop a second hometown, and grow in a healthier way, he said. Cho considers the program to be part of a large plan for more balanced, sustainable development in the country. Korea is traditionally a rice-farming society, but unfortunately some kids these days think rice grows on trees, Cho said, laughing. The goal is to... Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. By February 1st, 1861, seven southern states had withdrawn from the United States of America. They created their own independent nation, the Confederate States of America. The South seceded because Abraham Lincoln, a Republican, had been elected president. Southerners believed he would support a constitutional ban on slavery. They were afraid their way of life would soon end. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe discuss the beginning of Abraham Lincoln's presidency. President-elect Lincoln traveled by train from his home in Illinois to Washington, D.C. Along the way, he stopped to make speeches. As he got closer to Washington, he was warned that a mob was planning to attack the train. He had to continue his trip in secret. Lincoln arrived in Washington nine days before his inauguration. It was a busy time. He talked with many people, including delegates to a peace convention. Every state was represented at the convention, except the states that had seceded. The delegates urged Lincoln to support slavery. They urged him not to go to war over the issue. Lincoln said only that he would faithfully execute the duties of president of all the United States. He said he would protect and defend the American Constitution. While Lincoln waited for Inauguration Day, he chose the members of his cabinet. He wanted men representing all opposing groups in the Republican Party. He hoped this would unite the party and give him support in the difficult years ahead. Lincoln chose William Seward as Secretary of State, Salmon Chase as Treasury Secretary, Gideon Wells as Navy Secretary, and Montgomery Blair as Postmaster General. Seward did not like Chase, Wells, or Blair. He told Lincoln that he could not serve in the cabinet with them. He said they would never be able to work together. Lincoln answered that he would be happy to make Seward ambassador to Britain instead of secretary of state. Seward gave up the argument and agreed to join the cabinet. Inauguration Day was the 4th of March. President-elect Lincoln rode to the ceremony with outgoing President James Buchanan. 
Buchanan was ready to give up his power. He told Lincoln, If you are as happy to get into the White House as I am to get out of it, you must be the happiest man alive. The inaugural ceremony took place outside the Capitol building. Lincoln was to give his inaugural speech before being sworn in. He had worked hard on the speech. He wanted to say clearly what his policy would be on slavery and secession. These were the issues which divided the country. These were the issues which were leading the country to civil war. This is what Lincoln said. There seems to be some fear among the people of the southern states that because a Republican administration is coming to power, their property and their peace and personal security are threatened. There has never been any reasonable cause for such fears. In fact, much evidence to the contrary has existed, open to their inspection. It is found in nearly all my published speeches. In one of those speeches, I declared that I had no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the States where it exists. I said I believed I had no legal right to do so, and no wish to do so. This statement is still true. I can only say that the property, peace, and security of no part of the country are to be in any way endangered by the incoming administration. Lincoln noted that 72 years had passed since the first president was inaugurated. Since then, he said, 15 men had led the nation through many dangers, generally with great success. He went on, I now begin the same job under great difficulty. The breaking up of the Federal Union, before only threatened, now is attempted. I believe that under universal law and the Constitution, the union of these states is permanent. This is shown by the history of the Union itself. The Union is much older than the Constitution. It was formed, in fact, by the Articles of Association in 1774. It was continued by the Declaration of Independence in 1776. It grew further under the Articles of Confederation in 1778, and finally, in 1787, one of the declared reasons for establishing the Constitution of the United States was to form a more perfect union. I therefore believe that, in view of the Constitution and the laws, the Union is not broken. I shall make sure, as the Constitution orders me to do, that the laws of the Union are obeyed in all the states. In doing this, there needs to be no bloodshed or violence, and there shall be none unless it be forced upon the national government. The power given to me will be used to hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government, and to collect the taxes. But beyond what is necessary for these purposes, there will be no invasion, no using of force against or among the people anywhere. 
Lincoln then repeated some statements he had made during his campaign for president. He used them to explain the differences between North and South. One part of the country, he said, believes slavery is right and should be extended. The other part believes slavery is wrong and should not be extended. This, he said, was the only important dispute. Lincoln admitted that even if the dispute could be settled peacefully, there were those who wanted to see the Union destroyed. He said his words were not meant for them. They were meant only for those people who really loved the Union. He said, Physically speaking, we cannot separate. We cannot remove our sections from each other, nor build an impassable wall between them. A husband and wife may be divorced and go away from or out of the reach of each other. But the different parts of our country cannot do this. They must remain face to face, and relations, friendly or hostile, must continue between them. Is it possible to make those relations better after separation than before? Can aliens make treaties easier than friends can make laws? Can treaties be more faithfully enforced between aliens than laws can be enforced among friends? My countrymen, one and all, think calmly and well upon this subject. Nothing valuable can be lost by taking time. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the great issue of civil war. The government will not attack you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though emotion may have damaged them, it must not break our ties of love. Abraham Lincoln then placed his hand on the Christian holy book, the Bible. The Chief Justice of the United States then spoke the presidential oath. Lincoln repeated the words, and the United States had a new president. Lincoln's first crisis came quickly. It was a problem left unsolved by the outgoing president. Lincoln had to decide immediately what to do about the federal fort in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, Fort Sumter. The fort was surrounded by southern artillery. Southern gunboats guarded the harbor. The federal troops inside Fort Sumter were getting dangerously low on food, but any attempt to send more men or supplies would be seen as an act of war, civil war. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak.